Therefore, surrealism is the lens through which you can truly see the black experience. The lens can feel foggy at first, but that's exactly what makes it so clear. It rejects the boundaries of black creation so that the creators can connect with their craft and their audiences limitlessly, all the while enlightening those who can't relate. In this video, I'll be explaining the origin, meaning, applications and effects of Afro-Surrealism so you can better digest what you're witnessing both on screen and in real life. In the 1930s, a group of black and Caribbean students in Paris founded the anti-colonial cultural and political movement Negritude. Negritude artists sought to reclaim the value of blackness and African culture. Their work was often a critique on imperialism and imperialist art to assert a more extensive appreciation of pre-colonial African culture. Without realizing it, the literary and artworks created during the Negritude movement made Afro-Surrealism possible. Aimé Césaire said that the meaning of the term was the simple recognition of the fact that one is black, the acceptance of this fact and of our destiny as blacks, of our history and our culture. In a world where shame is deeply planted in the hearts of black people, the examples you're seeing being the lesser of countless other evils, negritude freed the minds of black people from self-hatred and a tireless attempt to appeal to the white gaze, eventually leading to the creation of an unapologetically pro-black cultural movement. In 1974, Amiri Baraka wrote for the Black American Literature Forum an essay entitled Henry Dumas, Afro-Surreal Expressionist. He explained that Dumas's power lay in his skill at creating an entirely different world organically connected to this one, the black aesthetic in its actual contemporary and lived life. Later in 2009, D. Scott Miller received approval from Baraka to rename the concept as Afro-Surrealism in his Afro-Surreal Manifesto. Miller said that Dumas had seen it, Baraka had named it, and so we were presented with a term to aid us in defining that special quality of the works of countless other artists and writers who've been seeing it for years. I say this because along with Dumas in the 70s, Jean Tumor had seen it in the 20s, Zora Neale Hurston in the 30s, Jacob Lawrence in the 40s, Vincent Smith in the 50s, and so on. All these creatives probably didn't know that they were expressing Afro-surrealistically, but that's the thing with Afro-surrealism. No one had or has to read Miller's manifesto for a step-by-step -step on how to have that creative approach, like they might have for another style. They just have to be black in a world full of white supremacy. The urge to create an Afro-surreal piece of work comes naturally when one reflects on their experiences to form new creative visions, so we may never know if an artist is intentionally creating for Afro-surrealism, and we may not always agree on what qualifies as an example of Afro-surrealism. If you know anything about art, you probably know about surrealism from the 20th century or realism from the 19th. In case you don't, realism is the art that accurately replicates what we see in nature and contemporary life with little to no interference from the artist's own imagination. The art is free of all embellishment. Surrealism then rejects the norm and conventions of realism. It uses details and techniques to seem realistic but depicts illogical, bizarre images to expand our interpretation of reality and often create discomfort. What surrealism did to realism, Afro-surrealism does to surrealism. Both movements embrace the absurd, but while surrealists were using automatic writing or painting and other techniques to try to grasp the absurd ideas of their unconscious mind to depict dream worlds, metaphysical realities, a reality beyond this one, black people were experiencing absurd realities every day of their lives. Just think how absurd it is that one race decided they were superior, decided to treat human beings like anything but, that a group of people have had their entire ethnic ancestry erased, were segregated in the country they had built, and the irony is hundreds of years later, they called us lazy, that the continent with the most natural and valuable resources remains in the worst living conditions. Absurdity is what fuels surrealism, and black people know absurdity like no one else. The surreal work is presented like it's normal, but is at its core preposterous. The Afro-surreal then packages its work as if it's preposterous with a real, commonly experienced core. You want to make some money here? Then read the script with the white boys. Like this young blood. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is Langston from Regal View. 
I didn't catch you at the wrong time, did I? Delivering a hyper-realistic depiction and using an unspoken language between marginalized communities. If surrealists were creating through their subconscious and unfiltered thoughts, it's only natural that unfiltered subconscious or conscious black thoughts are going to reflect upon the black experience, and it's only logical that these surrealists, with their own techniques, objectives, and styles, have their own name too. Afro surrealists use their works, whether it be music, film, literature, or visual art, to expose and or critique the normalized societal structures that are currently universally being imposed on black people to affect their livelihood. This exposition is not even done purposefully, though it is done unapologetically. This is America. Remember, Afro surrealism is not a political movement, it's built on surrealism. So, like I just said, the black, unfiltered subconscious thoughts just happen to expose the treatment of black people in Western countries and imperialist Africa. They just can't help it, especially not when black people have consistently been silenced and or spoken for. Lacey Murphy and Kevin McCoy explain in their essay, Afro Surrealism, What Black Is and Can Be, that the often cited first Afro Surrealist, Suzanne Césaire of the 40s, had defined Afro Surrealism as balancing two opposing views that had little room for compromise. Opposing views such as white and black, European and African, and civilized and savage. Nowadays, the opposition of future and past is also sought after and dissected, introducing another goal of the Afro-Surrealist, to expose what the movement calls the right now, where a reflection on a troubling past meets an account of an unpredictable future. Here is where the Afro-Surrealist's mission is to expose either an act of racism or imperialism that is being experienced right now, or a view of old happenings and times with the eyes of right now. As I mentioned earlier, there are no rules to Afro-Surrealism, no manual guide on how to be an Afro-Surrealist and no small detail we can look for in an art to know for certain whether or not it can be considered Afro-Surreal. The term was coined long after the works that informed it were created, therefore one can be an Afro-Surrealist without being aware that they are, without setting the intention to be so. Whether Miller wrote his manifesto to encourage artists to use Afro-Surrealism or merely to identify and appreciate the genius of Afro-Surrealists is unknown. I personally feel that the term is useful as a subgenre name, a tool for appreciating the works that we feel are examples, grouping them together and articulating what we want to see more of. Though we may not always agree that a work is Afro-Surreal, we are still having a conversation about it, which I think most artists hope for at the end of the day. Possibly the most popular example of Afro-Surrealism right now, Atlanta is a television series created, written and directed by actor, comedian and music artist Donald Glover, screenwriters Stephen Glover, Stefani Robinson and Zazie Beetz, director Hiro Murai and others. Glover had said in an interview that he wanted to create a show that authentically displayed what life in the state of Atlanta is like, but he also compared it to the surrealist show Twin Peaks, but with rappers and it's often exploring the fine line between dreams and reality. Like every television series, Atlanta has a skeletal chain of main characters who we see navigate their lives, relationships, careers, and views of the world. In the pilot episode, the viewer is presented with an average premise for the direction of the series. College dropout struggling at a job he dislikes, decides to become manager for his cousin who he just found out is now a rapper, he seems to have feelings for the mother of his child who does not seem to reciprocate these feelings. What's special about Atlanta is even in the very first few episodes, we can see the writers pushing boundaries with their bold topics and by eliciting discomfort amongst the audience. In the second episode of the first season, main characters Ern and Alfred are arrested and Ern continues to await his release for what seems like days after Alfred is gone. In the waiting room of the prison, the strangers that surround Ern are somewhat odd and the viewer is immersed into an unsettling, uncomfortable and fearful atmosphere, paying full attention to every moment. This immersion in discomfort is what makes the brutal beating of a noticeably unwell prisoner all the more shocking. The viewer is drawn into the prison with Ern, experiencing the same state of unease and confusion as him, and then forced to experience the same state of appallment and dismay. 
The beating at this moment feels almost imagined for both the viewer and Ern. It's certainly not expected, predicted, or even justified, so it feels surreal. But as we all know, police brutality is very real and very common. This is the earliest time Afro-surrealism is really used in Atlanta to depict the black experience, giving the non-black viewer a snippet of what it means to be black. Another shockingly surreal episode of Atlanta was Three Slaps, the first episode of season three, written in 2009 by Stephen Glover, where the familiar cast are barely seen. Instead, we are introduced to a young black boy, Laquarius, whose white school counselor believes is in danger with his mother and grandfather and who decides to call the authorities. The boy is then removed from his home and placed in the care of two white women who have already adopted three other black children who are clearly unkept and underfed. We see Laquarius trying to persevere through a seemingly painful and comfortable life with these strangers who all have their own eerie air about them. This is she. We're having dinner. The episode is full of bizarre moments, but the surreal climax of this episode is when the white women drive the four black children off a cliff, killing them all. One of the main characters, Ern, is then finally shown at the end of the episode, waking up, so we're somewhat relieved at the suggestion that it was all a dream. Throughout this episode, the viewer is confused, trying to make sense of the supposedly illogical aspects, and by the end of it, they just don't know what to think. It seems the episode is random and closer to a horror than the authenticity we're used to from Atlanta. However, this is only true for the viewer who has no knowledge of the real-life incident of March 2019, when Jennifer and Sarah Hart intentionally drove their six adopted black children off a California cliff. As Christy Turnquist wrote for The Oregonian, the case became national news because of the horrifying nature of the killing of the children and the attention one of the children, Devonte Hart, the inspiration for Aquarius, received in 2014 after a photo of him went viral. The photo depicts Devonte tearfully hugging a white police officer at a protest following a grand jury decision not to indict the police officer who shot and killed Michael Brown Jr. Many found this photo to be a hopeful, optimistic outlook on the relationship between black people and police officers, exclaiming that we need more of this and other love brings the world together statements that also resurfaced in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. Catherine Bennett wrote for the observers that there are many versions of the actual interaction between Devonte and the police officer, but many believe the incident to have been staged by Jennifer Hart. The Atlanta episode depicts this incident as follows. The white woman forced the children to wear free hug signs at the local farmer's market and Laquarius runs to a police officer to beg for help, hugging him tightly before the officer then pushes him off, ignoring his concerns. One of the white adoptive mothers then tells the officer, All four of our children are black, so we always make sure to tell them that the police are their friends. A sentence that sounds much like the hundreds of tweets celebrating the picture of Devonte. Atlanta's decision to depict this story as a dream is not to suggest that it didn't actually happen. The writers were aware that many of their viewers would recognize the story. So what they're suggesting with the ending scene is that the story is so absurd and bizarre that it could have been dreamt. It's so absurd that it was unbelievable, literally. I could go on and explain the social significance and creativity of many other Atlanta episodes, but that needs its own video. So if you haven't already watched the show, I recommend you at least watch these episodes, which don't require much backstory knowledge to be appreciated and enjoyed. Before I move on, I'd like to address that Atlanta is often classified as a comedy. And yeah, some scenes do make us laugh. The writers are smart, know their audience, and were challenging the conventions of television like no others. So of course it uses some dark humor. However, black people know more than anyone that sometimes you have to laugh because you can't cry. You have to laugh because you can't believe what just happened and there's nothing else you can do. So yes, Atlanta makes us laugh, cackle even, but to call it a comedy is a deceiving, insensitive understatement because I don't think there's a single emotion Atlanta didn't make me feel. Like fear and comedy are very closely related. They're always touching each other, like, you know. 
Some other examples of Afro-surrealism in film include Random Acts of Flyness, Lovecraft Country, Black Orpheus, Sorry to Bother You, Candyman, and Get Out, where I personally think the only Afro-surreal part is the sunken place. My first musical Afro-surrealist is the rapper and producer, the one in the mask, aka the metal face, aka the villain, aka MF Doom. Known best for his cartoonish samples and indestructible flow, Doom's lyrics are often described as random, which one, is rarely ever true, and two, wildly undermines his skill. Doom's lyrics are not meant to make sense to us all the time. His premise is that he's a supervillain controlling the minds of the world's greatest leaders, causing chaos on Earth with his deadly tracks, sometimes even a three-headed monster taking over the planet. So why would he write lyrics that were easily digestible for the average human? The piece is telling me the story, so I don't really know the story yet. I find like one or two things that reference a, a subject matter, a topic, you know what I'm saying? And then what happens is it will start telling me more and more. Then I, I'll join the conversation towards the end. This kind of relationship between their creative and their work is very common amongst Afro-surrealists. They are extremely connected to their craft, so much so that their subconscious begins to complete it for them. Doom uses vivid imagery, esoteric storytelling, an abundance of references and countless metaphors, sometimes all in one bar line. His genius lyricism is so condensed that it is literally indigestible on the first listen, which many confuse with being pointless. For example, in his song Accordion from the Mad Villainy album with Mad Lib the producer, he says, yeah, when he at the mic, it's like the place get like, oh yeah, it's like they know what's about to happen. Just keep your eye out like I, I capping. Andre Gaynor, or Lyricology 101, analyzed these lyrics beautifully in his YouTube video. He explained that in these bars, Doom is discussing how his fans sit in anticipation of his art. He tells them to keep an eye out for him like a pirate by using a well-known pirate's phrase. What's more is he is also referencing the third eye, a belief amongst some spiritual groups that everyone has a third eye, known as the pineal gland which lies between and above your eyebrows and exposes us to other universal dimensions. So he's saying use your third eye to observe his supernatural greatness, his out of this world skill. To take it even further in that line, he says the word eye three times to represent the three eyes. Doom loved to throw his listeners off, whether it was by pausing before completing his rhymes Again, call back and do the same thing tomorrow Or ending his lines in a way we wouldn't expect To the Matrix is mad glitches Spit so many verses sometimes my jaw twitches One thing this party can use is more Please <coughs> put yourself in your own shoe Taking his rhymes in a direction he knows is not expected Humbling the listener his unpredictability remains completely unmatched and only made his lyrics that much more complex. He created layers and layers of intertwined themes and created never-ending space for interpretations. Doom pushed the boundaries of the English language in a way that makes his work timeless and impossible to get used to. He dismissed the rules of grammar, rarely using connective words or personal pronouns, throwing the listener into a field of his consciousness and not providing any aid for our comprehension. He's, he's, is, he's, is, he rhymes as, as weird as I feel. Whether you think you're getting at what he's saying or not doesn't matter to him and doesn't stop him from being a true MC, a principle very in line with afro surrealism Next is Sun Ra, the jazz composer, band leader, poet, philosopher, theatre performer, piano and synthesizer player of the 50s to 90s. As Kristen Adams wrote in 2019, Ra's essence embodied and pioneered Afrofuturism, the descendant of Afro-surrealism. As Kristen defines it, Afrofuturism reimagines the future of art, science, music, etc. through the black lens, acknowledging what black people could have been in the absence of the colonialist system. Sunra's philosophy defined Afrofuturism without naming it as forward-looking while recalling the past, the ancient and the classical. Like Afro-surrealism, Afro-futurism feels unreal and bizarre but is at its core real and true, especially when we consider that what Afro-futurists imagine for the future is not too far from what once was for Africans, a history mostly lost due to the common tenets of history from the imperialist lens. 
Ra's music challenges the subconscious impacts of words and sounds on the listener and has pumped out over 100 albums for us to devour. His goal was to change the world by creating music from happier worlds. He reached out far beyond the conventions and boundaries of the present, presenting space for future gazing and myth making, inspiring artists like Earth, Wind and Fire, Erica Badu, Flying Lotus, Janelle Monet, and Funkadelic, who have been said to have brought Afrofuturism to New York, where I found my next Afro series. John Michel Basquiat was coming to fame in 1980s New York. He created hundreds of incredibly layered and detailed artworks during his short career, through which he explored his mixed African, Latinx, and American heritage, questioned capitalism, nepotism, and greed, delivering poetic messages sometimes inspired by the media he consumed as he created. Another example of creativity that may seem pointless but holds heavy social commentary and significance. Also unintentional, for he was not a political figure, he was reflecting on his life, which was a black man in the 80s in America. And you're, you're seen as, as some sort of uh, primal expressionism, is that... I mean, like an ape? Well, uh, let, let's... Like a primate? Well... Well, I don't know. Is that, is that you said it, I don't Another Afro-surreal painter is Ibrahim Asilahi, who began in the 60s. Elvira Diangano Ose, a curator for the Tate Modern Museum, explained that after Asilahi's imprisonment in Cooper Jail, his work became more somber and airy, saying he began letting his unconscious mind follow his art till completion. He called this the organic growth of a picture or artwork most notably seen in his painting entitled The Inevitable from the 80s, where you can see the growth of the artwork as it's presented as a mural. This piece is similar to Asilahi's description of the secret small drawings he would make in jail, hide in the sand and return to, adding on each time. The Inevitable is filled with distorted depictions of African people, various bizarre techniques that create tone and deals with the major uprising in the history of Sudan around 1985 to 86. Some other Afro-surreal visual artists include Kara Walker, Wanjeki Mutu, and Yinka Sholibari. Finally, here are some of my personal favorite Afro-surreal novels. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.